Thanks for coming out. We apologize. This is feeling like a Monday to you guys. It is to me today. Um, we're having a little, some trouble, so sorry I, some of you guys uh, showed up a little bit early, and we apologize. It looks like there was a some kind of um, wires crossed in the communications there, so uh, we'll try to resolve that so that doesn't happen again. We, we think we know why, why it happened. Um, I did want to mention the user conference. So how many of you have heard about the user conference? I'm hoping for a lot of hands there. Yay. Okay. Great. Great. So it is next month. It's October 21st. And we have a lot of great presentations lined up. We're nailing those down this week. Sign-ups are actually next week. So um, you'll see an announcement. Um, as soon as the uh, sign-ups are ready in the Connect Carolina newsletter, it will also be on the CC Info website. And uh, we do ask, you can come if you don't register, but we would really love it if you would choose your sessions. And the reason is that we book the size of the room based on the interest levels. And so if nobody signs up, we might have a room for 20 people and have 100 people show up. So that's what we don't want to happen. Also, um, if you sign up, you'll get lunch. You'll get to pick your lunch. So if you don't sign up, there won't be a lunch for you. So if that's not a motivator, I don't know. I don't know what is. So, okay. So I hope to see you at the user conference. Hope to get you guys to all sign up and participate. And um, we have a bunch of about 24 sessions lined up, and you get to pick the ones that you want to attend. All right. So um, let me go ahead and. Oh, it might need to be turned off. Uh, sorry. That's okay. It's just our day today. I know. It is. It's our day. Okay. So we do have a packed agenda for you guys. Um, so Rich is here to talk about the process, the new process for requesting reports. So if you have a report that you're looking for, this is the how to get it into the queue. Um, Megan and Corey are going to talk about some tricky transactions. So I don't know if you remember, but we did a session uh, quite a few months ago now um, highlighting some tricky transactions and how to work with that. And they'll get you active and working on that as well. And they also have some reminders for you. Um, Brian Summit from the payroll department here is our new official payroll director. I don't know what the official title is. I'll let you tell him. <laughs> um, and he's here to give us an update on commitment accounting. Um, and then he's also going to talk about some up updates related to payroll. So I'll go ahead and let them get started. So I'm going to turn it over to Rich. Is it, do you need to do slides or anything? No, I can do it. Okay. All right, so we'll pick up a little bit of time. I just wanted to make sure that people knew um, how to get report requests in. Um, it's a little bit different process. We presented this a time or two, but um, basically um, everybody should be familiar with um, you know, the Connect Carolina user information screen. You can go in um, to the reporting tab, um, and there's a place there that um, has a link, use this new report information request form. So that's a form that if you're asking for a report, we ask you to fill out. I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. Um, and then there's a, a link out to the process. So if you don't remember everything I said, you can click there and find out what the process is so it doesn't go off into uh, Never Never Land. So um, basically the link that tells you the process, um, we're asking for folks to go out and try to check and see if there's a similar report already available. There's a couple of ways to do that. You could talk to your MOU or HR officer um, to see if there's something there. Um, we're working to try to build out um, finance is a little ahead of us, um, build out the list of existing reports um, so um, so that you can kind of go in one place and see what the reports are that are out there and how you might use those. So we'll be building that out over the next month or two. Um, so and if it's a new, if it's a request and you can't find any report out there, then we're asking that you fill out this um, standard form. Uh, people who've been around for a while in the past may remember we used to have a listserv address called HRIS-projects that you could send stuff into. So we're asking people not to use that anymore because um, we want you to use this process. That way it drops right into Remedy and gets into the queue and we don't have to transfer things around. So um, you know, we'll kind of be phasing out that HRIS-projects listserv. So that form I was talking about, um, basically at the top it asks you, you know, who you are and where, so we know how to get back in touch with you. Um, it is a Word document, so when you click on it, you should be able to type all the stuff in there. 
um, and then it's trying to prompt you um, to ask the questions that we normally would have to call you back and ask. So, um, you know, what's the description of it? Who's it for? When's it needed by? Is this get run periodically? Is this an on-demand report? Um, does it need to have selection criteria? What columns? What calculations? So we're asking you to fill out as much as you can as you might know about it so that, so that we can kind of speed up the process. Um, and then, once this is filled out, we're asking you to save that and then attach it to the remedy to the remedy process that you're going to see. So um, now everything's kind of coming in through the remedy queue. So you can go to help.unc.edu um, and then type of help needed. You'll see there's now a selection called Connect Carolina Reports and Queries. Um, if it's an existing report and if important is a bug, there's a selection for that as well. And then if you can, if you know it's an HR report or a finance report or a student systems report, put that in the second box, um, and that just helps it to route directly to the queues. Um, if you're not quite sure, you can put in I don't know, and then that goes to a triage queue, and, and somebody will look at it and try to figure out which one to put it in. And then there is, this is the place where um, you can put in the problem description. It's like I need a new report, and you can attach uh, stuff there. So then the next question often is, is what happens after that? So um, when it gets into our queue, a business analyst does an initial review, and they're looking at this to try to figure out if this is an um, error correction on an existing report, whether or not it's an info or a Connect Carolina. Um, if it's an error on the existing report, then that doesn't have to get prioritized. It goes in, that's like a break fix, and it kind of goes right through the process. Um, if it's a modification to an existing reporter query, you say, I need some new fields, I need some different things on it, then that would go, um, the business analyst looks at it, tries to make sure there's enough information, and then we would go to the business process and technology subcommittee at the HR Council and you know, say here's all the requests that we've um, been asked for, which ones you know, seem to be more broadly campus-based, and which ones you want us to prioritize higher. Um, and then whatever that committee recommends, then it kind of goes out to the, the bigger HR council. Um, so that's still within the HR world. And then uh, there's a Connect Carolina Integrated Management, which is across finance, um, HR, and students. So we've tried to see how things are interacting across the different things. So, so basically, that's the prioritization process. Um, if it's a new request um, that's more of an operational report or query, it kind of goes through the same. There are some reports that you, know, you really don't have a choice on. It's an external regulatory thing. You know, it's like we are required to report this by September 30th because it's accreditation, whatever. So um, we don't necessarily, we will alert the business process technology subcommittee and the HR council um, and everything that we have to do that, but it's not really that they get to prioritize regulatory things out. So, and we've had a lot of regulatory stuff, you know, whether it's ACA reporting or different things. So um, we're still kind of dealing with a lot of the um, things that we're required to do. So went through that kind of fast, but I just want to be, you know, just let you know that it was there. Don't use the old listserv. Try to get them in remedy tickets. That way you'll know, and then we'll be able to tell you when the report's been done. Any questions on that process? Yes? Okay. Okay. Was that an info port? Uh, so the question was that there was some. Um, sorry, I'm repeating. So that they, can, um, they went through the process, but the, the the response that came back through the remedy system was that um, the, a referral had been made and the ticket was being closed, and that caused some some anxiety. Um, so um, we're trying to work through that process. Um, at what was happening before, it would go to refer to the info port team, and then they were closing the ticket, and then the info port team had an open ticket. And so we're, we heard some of that feedback, so we're trying to keep the remedy tickets open, even if we have to open it up in another um, environment for actual work, so that it kind of track back, because that was causing some, some concern. So I'd be curious how recently that occurred. Hopefully it was a three, four weeks, month ago. A couple of days ago? Okay, so we need to work that process more. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Any other questions or feedback on that? Okay, thank you. I'll now um, turn it over to Megan. Good morning, everybody. 
I am Megan Keith. I'm the Senior Business Analyst and Team Lead for the HIVAs. And Corey and I are both going to take you through a tricky transaction today. So you should have gotten a handout with the tricky transactions on them. If you did not get one, there are additional copies in the back of the room. Raise your hand and Corey will bring you one. So we're going to try to make this interactive and we're going to ask you guys to take a few minutes and answer the questions on the tricky transactions. So the first one is moving supplemental pay from a primary job to a secondary job. And so here's the scenario you're working with. So today is Wednesday, 9-16-2015 and we want to move supplemental pay for Professor Blue from his or her primary job over to a secondary appointment. So there are a series of questions for you on a tricky transaction. So go ahead and take a few minutes and jot your answers to those down and then we'll walk through them all together. Is this to a current secondary appointment they already have? Correct. The question was is this to a current secondary appointment that they already have and the answer is yes. And we're not going to make you call out your answers, so don't be afraid to, to guess and get the wrong answer. The reason we picked the two transactions we picked is because they are tricky. We keep getting lots of tickets in related to these issues. So really don't be afraid to guess and guess wrong. Yes, the question is, is this an existing secondary appointment? And the answer is yes. We'll see a couple people writing. We'll give you like another minute to finish up.
you can recall that time. All right, so the first uh, question is, which DPAR will be used for the changes? Job change. Anybody got that? Who? Good. What effective dates should you use for the actions? This is kind of a trick question, so it really depends. Um, a couple key gotchas. So the first thing is you need to make sure you use the same effective date for both actions. If you don't use the same effective date, then the employee is going to end up getting either overpaid or underpaid, depending on which way the difference goes. So really important to use the same effective date for both. And then both actions have to execute fully prior to the lockout for the current monthly payroll. So we are entering the actions today. We'd want to make sure that they both fully executed prior to the lockout next week. Really, really important, and we saw quite a few tickets related to this in the August monthly, monthly payroll. Um, you don't want to use retro or backdating effective dates or the employee will be underpaid. Um, so say we used effective dates for our actions um, in August. We're going to have a scenario where the employee gets underpaid, and I have an example later that I'll explain that in a little more detail. Can you enter both EPARs at the same time? The answer is yes, because each action is on a different ample record number. So if we were trying to do two things to the employee's primary job, we could only do one action at a time. But because these are on two different ample records, we can actually enter them at the same time. Which EPAR should be entered first? Either way we work, um, we kind of recommend that you stick with the primary job. Always start with the primary job, just best practice. And what type of comp rate should be used for the supplemental pay? It should be the SUPPRT, the monthly flat rate, and you should be entering a monthly flat rate amount in the field. All right, so what happens if the EPAR to add the supplement to the secondary job executes prior to the September payroll lockout? but the EPAR to remove the supplement from the primary job does not. The employee is going to get overpaid for the month of September. The delivered Connect Carolina retro pay process will correct the overpayment automatically in October, assuming that that second EPAR executes prior to the October payroll lockout. Now, it's if it happens the other way around that we run into more troubles, and this is the same reason that we don't want to backdate the pay dates and use something prior to the current payroll. So if the EPAR to remove the supplement from the primary job executes in time, but the EPAR to add the supplement to the secondary job does not get in before the payroll lockout, so the employee is going to get underpaid in September. And the delivered retro pay process is not going to pick up the payment. And the reason for that is because retro pay only works, and Brian, please jump in and correct me if you can think of an easier way to uh, explain this. The retro pay process only works if the employee actually received a paycheck on the EMPL record on which the payment occurred in that pay period. So because the, in this example, the employee didn't get an August, any pay for August on EMPL record one, the retro pay process doesn't know to pick that payment up. Does that make sense to everybody? So in this scenario, the only way to ensure that the employee gets paid correctly is for you to log a remedy ticket for the back pay for September. And then that will have to be manually processed by the BAs on the payroll team to make sure that the employee gets paid correctly. And this is why we don't want you to do these actions outside of the current payroll because it's automatically going to create a situation where we have to intervene manually. Does that make sense? Any questions about this tricky transaction? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Corey. Thanks, Megan. You're welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Corey Mims, and I am the lead employment consultant in human resources. And I know we have talked a lot about expected job end date, but there still are tickets coming in with questions about expected job end date. So we have another tricky transaction on expected job end dates on the flip side of your um, handout. 
And the scenario is the developmental engineering department is hiring Jane Jones into an EPA appointment for one year effective October 1st, 2015. So if you want to take some time to answer those questions, and we'll go through the answers together. You ready to go through the answers, or do you need some more time? Okay, great. So is Jane's expected job end date September 30th of 2016, or is it October 1st of 2016? Well done. Yes, it's October 1st, 2016. Um, so the expected end date is always the first day the employee will no longer receive pay or will no longer be working. Sex question is not on your sheet. I threw it in. Um, here is the, if the expected end date is October 1st, 2016, what date is Jane expected to be paid through? Yes, exactly. And just as a reminder for EPA employees, if you do not terminate them, they will continue to be paid beyond their expected job end date. If Jane is reappointed for another year, what form should the department use? Job change or the edit existing job EPAR, exactly. This is the EPAR that's used, that you'll use to update a person's, an employee's job data. So update pay, supervisor, working title, and job end date. What effective date should be used on the edit existing job form to extend her end date by a year? Yes, exactly, 10-1. Um, this is the effective, or the effective date is going to be the first day of her reappointment. What would Jane's new expected job end date be? Exactly, yep. So again, if they're reappointed for a year, you always look to put the expected job end date out by one day. When would the form to reappoint Jane need to execute by? Mm -hmm. Fully execute prior to the payroll lockout for the month in which she's being reappointed. When would the form to extend an end date for an SPA student or SPA temporary employee need to execute by? I, sorry. Exactly. So the EPAR needs to fully execute prior to that person's end date because SPA temps and students work differently. They are automatically terminated on their expected job end date. So if you need to extend it, make sure that that executes fully prior to that date. And make sure you monitor your biweekly payroll lockout timeframes. So you do that in advance of the lockout. If Jane's appointment ends after one year, 
what would be the effective date of her termination? Exactly. Yes. Well done. Um, what would happen if you terminated her on 9-30-2016 instead? Yes, she would be shorted a day. What happens if her expected job end date is September 30th, 2016, and you put in a termination action effective 10 2016 Your EPAR will get stuck at the integration broker, and there could be delays with the termination action. So the termination action can never have an effective date that is greater than the expected job end date. Does that make sense? And when would the form to terminate Jane need to execute by to ensure she's not overpaid? Yep. So, so needs to execute prior to the lockout in the month in which the termination is occurring. And just a reminder that the department needs to make sure their school division approvers have all approved by their deadline in order for central office to ensure that we meet our deadline before the payroll lockout. Any questions on expected job end date or smooth and supplemental pay before I turn it back over to Megan? So we have a couple of HR reminders for you. So we wanted to cover just a few quick things that we've been seeing uh, high volume come in with the tickets. So just to run them by you guys. So I'm going to talk about effective dating with lump sum. So lump sum payment sort of best practices, do's and don'ts. So don't enter multiple future dated payments of the same payment type at the same time. We've seen some people who are going out and um, say you have a faculty member coming in and you know they're going to be doing something regularly for you and you're going to be paying them, say, $500 a month for the next three months. Do not go out and put all three payments in at the same time. The reason for that is because, well, two reasons. One, if they get approved out of order, um, they're going to get stuck at the integration broker. So say you put one for September, one for October, one for November, and the November one gets approved first, that means that the September and the October ones are going to get stuck and have to be handled manually. Uh, the second reason is that the way the lump sum payments work can be a little finicky sometimes. So if we have multiple payments out there stacked up like that, we have seen scenarios where occasionally the payments do not get paid out correctly. Um, so it's best to keep stuff effective for the current pay period and, and not try to stack those future dated lump sums out there. Uh, we also don't want you to use effective dates in the past because we've had some problems with this as well. Um, we think we have all of the bugs with this fixed, but based on the number of problems we've seen around effective dates and lump sums, we recommend just best practice to use an effective date for the EPAR that is in the current pay period. Um, you have the the work period, work start, and work end date, I think, fields on the lump sum payment form, and you should be using those to track the actual dates that the work was performed, and those are the dates that we are feeding to the ESERT system for effort reporting. So the effective date is really more of a back-end thing for a lump sum and doesn't need to reflect the actual date the work was performed. Don't use an effective date prior to the employee's hire date. Um, you'd be surprised, but we've had a couple tickets come in on this recently. Um, we have had some employees come in who are high-level administrators and are getting something like a housing allowance, um, you know, for the first few months that they're here. When you enter that payment, you need to make sure that the effective date of the lump sum does not predate their hire date or the lump sum is going to get stuck at the integration broker and we're going to have to send it back to you to have the date changed. Also, don't use an effective date after the employee's termination date. So same sort of scenario, just in reverse. The employee needs to be active in the dates for which the lump sum is submitted for it to get paid out correctly. So the best practices are to use effective dates in the current pay cycle, use the work period start and end dates to reflect the actual dates that the work was performed, and to use effective dates that line up with the employee's active status. Any questions? Okay. Return from work break. Um, we continue to see a lot of issues with using the short work break and return from work break actions for students. We had a lot of issues with the August payroll, so I just wanted to quickly cover some do's and don'ts for work break, return from work break as well. So it's really important when you go to do the reappointment for the student that you actually put that return from work break action on the job change EPAR. If you go in and do a reappointment for somebody who's out on short work break but forget to add that action, 
it's not going to change their payroll status. And you'll, you can see on the EPAR, the, the, the little header, it'll show that their status still shows short work break. So that should clue you in that there's a problem with that EPAR. If their payroll status stays in short work break, even if you've gone in and done a reappointment and up their salary, they're not going to get paid correctly for that month. And as Corey mentioned, don't wait to enter the action until after the expected job end date has passed. We need you to go in and make sure you get that reappointment in there prior to the end date. So best practices, make sure you put that return from work break action on the EPAR when you are reappointing the student. Make sure you extend the expected job end date at the same time. And make sure you get the EPAR initiated prior to the date of the previous expected job end date. And of course, always get all your stuff in prior to the payroll lockout. Any questions on return from work break or short work break? Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another thing we received a lot of tickets on um, in August is departments and campus users not being able to start new EPARs to create positions because they were blocked. Um, from an EPAR that was stuck. And so I just wanted to chat briefly. I know something went out in the digest. But just a quick reminder, because um, this was a lesson learned for us. Um, once you pass step one of the add update position EPAR, um, don't navigate back to that page and then uncheck the funding box or check it if you had unchecked it or unchecked it previously. Um, when you go back and then move forward again, it basically corrupts the EPAR. The action, even if it gets approved all the way through, won't execute and create your position number, and it'll prevent other users on campus from being able to start new um, position actions. So if you get to the funding page in the add update position and you realize, oh, I didn't mean to do this, just click on the HR uh, work center again and start the action over again. Don't put it on hold or anything. Just exit the EPAR you're in and start from scratch. And I thought, because sometimes it's easier to see things, I would just demo that quickly. So I'm going to start my new EPAR for, to add, update a position. And I'm going to click to create my new position. And this is the culprit here, enter funding data for this position. We'll create a work study job. Quick note while we're here, you'll see for the salary grade for work study, it's SO1 through SO4 and TMP. Um, even though TMP shows up here, please do not select it. For work study, you will want to pick the hiring range that's associated with the work study position you're hiring for, which is S1 through 4. If TMP is selected, it'll get stuck at the integration broker. So if at this point I see that I'm on the compensation page and I didn't mean to be here, the best thing to do is just go back to the EPAR homepage. Because if you click previous and come back to this first page or step one, and uncheck the box and move forward. One, you'll get this message. And if you ever see a message that does, you can't decipher, that's a good clue that, that something is happening behind the scenes that, that needs to be looked at. So um, you can either at this point call the help desk or just exit the EPAR altogether and start over again. But if you do continue to move forward, if you click OK and come to the first page, you'll notice also all your data is gone. That should be another clue that something's going on. So, um, And if you ever have any questions, call the help desk, call me, um, and happy to walk you through it. Are there any questions? Yes, Megan. I just wanted to add that for both the, the work study salary grade issue that you mentioned and this issue of blocking the form, help everybody else, we do have a blog. Don't stop. We will have to fix the form production at some point. Thanks, Megan. So what Megan said was that for the salary grade um, reflecting TMP and the bug about moving back and forward and the EPAR getting uh, uh, corrupted, um, there are bugs that will uh, be, I'm sorry, there are tickets that will correct those issues moving forward in the future.
and then it'll be announced when that's available. To, uh, yes. If, when that does happen, it's not a culprit of that. It happened a lot. Um, it happened a lot. Do y'all get notified automatically when that happens? Sometimes I'll click on there and see I can't create a position because. Or do we need to let you know? So the question is, if you get the, if you go in to start a new EPAR and you get the message basically that says a new EPAR cannot be started because one's already in progress, um, do you need to notify someone or not? And yes, please do notify the help desk. You can send me an email. Um, but we do not receive notification when that happens. So we need your help to let us know if that's going on. Or just reiterate yes. that the best practice is Good point, sorry. So, um, uh, strike through that I said to contact me, and instead contact the help desk, because um, that, that's the best practice in the event I'm out of the office or in a meeting. <laughs> other questions or feedback? Just one other thing, because mm -hmm. you're talking about add update positions. Could you just um, briefly mention the transferring a position and making sure you do include funding? Sure. So Trace has asked me to um, speak to if you are transferring a position from one department to another department, don't uncheck the funding box. You want to make sure if you're transferring a position from department A to department B, that as part of that action you enter in the funding on the transfer. Otherwise, that funding does not move over in the department budget table. Thank you. Questions or feedback? I'm going to turn it over to Brian for some commitment accounting updates. Thank you, Corey. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Sim and I'm from the payroll office. Um, first, I wanted to thank all of you for your help over the last year and wanted to know if all of you realized on Tuesday the payroll office reached an extremely important milestone and we couldn't have reached it without the help of all of you. Who knows what it is? Anyone? <laughs> oh, Deborah, you don't? Deborah? <laughs> yes, Deborah knows because we've corresponded about it earlier in the week. Yes? It's actually we've completed our 26th biweekly payroll in Connect Carolina. So congratulations to all of you. That was actually a very important milestone. And that was one of the reasons that for, in particular for the payroll office, that our real go live was actually prior to October 1st. <clears throat> so just first, just a couple updates from commitment accounting. Number one, um, I think you all know about the uh, PAT tool and the payroll accounting adjustment tool that is the replacement for the short-term retro tool. Just by way of quick update, we are finalizing development. Um, we're still one of the things that actually have been the most challenging for us is to convert all of the data that was in the short-term retro tool that's actually taken us a little longer than we thought. And so our rollout has actually been delayed a little bit. but. We're coming in on the home stretch of doing that. We're working on the reports that we hope to roll out. There's actually two reports that will roll out by way of PeopleSoft. It'll be a suspense report that shows you all transactions that have gone into suspense and all um, transactions that have been entered in PAT that have not yet been approved that are actually pending. We, at some point in time, will roll out a labor expenditure report possibly in PeopleSoft itself. But what for the initial go live for Pat is going to be actually done in Infoport. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that we do thorough testing on actually running it in PeopleSoft to make sure that it does not adversely impact performance because I'm sure all of you would not want that to happen. But for go live with the Pat tool, which will happen later in October, we will roll it out through Infoport. We're having a final round of campus testing. We'll be bringing in some users from that. We haven't quite scheduled it. We think it's probably going to happen over September 30th, October 1st, and October 2nd, but I have not sent that out just yet. We sent um, notification to the MOU leads. Actually, I think it was the week before last. This slide actually I used in a previous presentation. 
asking them who should have access to that new tool. Those responses were due to us today. I have not received a lot of them yet from some of the schools and divisions, so I'll be sending out a reminder tonight. Along with that, we sent out a spreadsheet that listed everyone who had performed transactions in the short-term retro tool, and we've indicated to the MOU lead to identify who from that list they would like to have access to the new tool and the type of access. If there's an individual in the unit that the MOU lead would like to provide access to the tool and they weren't listed on the spreadsheet, they need to follow sort of the normal procedure to, for requesting access via info port, and we've added the PAT tool on that form. The reason for that is if they had access in the short-term retro tool, we have sign-off on that, and um, with the spreadsheet that we're using, it sort of abbreviates or shortcuts the normal process, so if they aren't on that list, we want them to follow the normal process. Any questions on that? And just so you know, we have had some questions from campus about can an individual be a basic user as well as an approver, and certainly that's fine. The MOU lead just needs to indicate that on the form, the spreadsheet that I sent out, but just so that you know, so that we follow good internal control guidelines, an individual cannot approve a transaction that they've initiated. So it takes at least two people to get a transaction through the system. Any questions on PAT? The other change is that's happening, and this change is actually going to take place prior to the rollout of PAT, and it's going to actually happen within the next couple of weeks. We're going to make a change so that in addition to entering distribution or funding data, funding instructions in dollars, you will also be able to enter it in percents. So right now what happens is whenever the payroll is confirmed, we run this very high-tech modification, which we affectionately call the flipper program, which essentially because we find a lot of times that the funding information that's in the system, the total salary does not necessarily match the total salary that the individual is being paid. And to try to mitigate the number of transactions that go to suspense, the flipper program goes out there, and on the department budget table, it changes all of the dollar amounts to percents, so they add up to 100, and then um, it distributes the payroll, and then it flips them back. And that's the reason that currently we have that CA lockout. So hopefully when we make this change from dollars to percent, we can eliminate that lockout. We're in the process of modifying the DT forms, modifying the reports and info port for that, and so this is something that's actually going to occur in the coming weeks. And Kelly, um, I thank you, Kelly actually has a handout for all of you just to sort of show you as a um, premiere of what that's actually going to look like in the DT forms. So pay attention. Does, it, does anyone need a copy of that? Okay. Anything on dollars to percents before I move on to the payroll updates? As you may have heard me mention in the past, we plan on rolling out online W-2s via employee self-service, and we actually want to do it in the fall of this year. What we're going to do is probably first, as sort of a test, we'll roll out 2014 W-2s to make that available for everyone to see those. And we're hoping to actually time that rollout with the creation of a guest account access process for employees that have been separated. Because one of the things that we find is the majority of requests that we get for duplicate W-2s are for individuals who are no longer working at the university. They get misrouted because their address hasn't been updated. They haven't informed you of their latest address, what have you. So we're going to roll out a guest account um, provisioning process whereby individuals who have been terminated can go in, create a guest account, and can actually use self-service to, th to see things like online W-2s when they're out there and their previous pay stubs. Then in January of 2016, 
along with issuing the printed W-2 forms, we'll also make them available online. They will actually probably be there prior to the printed versions actually getting distributed because it's much quicker to be able to issue them online. And hopefully sometimes next year as part of a green initiative, we will um, send out broadcast messages encouraging employees to actually go in and waive their right to a paper W-2 and select the online W-2. According to IRS regulations, you really need to issue everyone a paper W-2 and they actually have to waive their right to see a paper W-2. So for 2016, we'll roll out the online W-2s and the paper W-2s and then sometime next calendar year, will allow employees to go in and actually opt, opt out of receiving a paper W-2. So we can eliminate that paper, um, which, can which can be a little bit of a project, to say the least, for all of you to get, about, to get them into employees' hands. And it's just another way to sort of protect individuals' identity and eliminate another piece of paper out there with some very vital information about employees. We're also working on rolling out through employee self-service an online W-4 and NC-4 form that will probably happen first quarter of 2016. And just so that you know, when we do roll that out, it will not be available to non-resident aliens because in most cases they really should not be completing the W-4 and NC-4 form. Any questions about that? Out-of-state tax withholding, first I'd like to thank all of you who have turned in forms notifying us of employees who are working and living in a state other than North Carolina. Those have um, come back in our office to David Lucas. David Lucas is assembling and compiling that information and actually now turning his attention to getting us registered in those states where employees are working. So we very much appreciate all of the work that you've done to get that information to us. A couple reminders on that. There is a form out on our website now that you can fill out to notify us when an employee begins working outside of the state of North Carolina. And also the reverse of that, when an employee who was formerly working in another state returns to working in the state of North Carolina. The other thing is just as a reminder, we would like to remind all of you to leverage that business to address on individuals to identify where they're actually working, what their work location is, particularly if it's not on campus and it happens to be out of state because we want to actually use that information as just another way for us to be notified when someone's work location is being changed from out of state to in state or from in state to out of state. Any questions on any of that? The manual check procedure, um, I apologize, I should have fixed my slide. It's not a policy, it's actually a procedure. The procedure is now out there. It's been published. The form is out there as well. I believe since last time I spoke with all of you, we've made a couple changes to it. Number one, the form now requires the signature of the HR officer or the HR officer's supervisor because we just want to make sure that the HR officer has an awareness to when manual checks are being requested. And then the last thing is we are not requiring that you submit a hard copy form to our office. What we're suggesting and actually prefer that you do is submit that as an attachment to a remedy ticket. We will do our best to keep that remedy ticket up to date so that you know that the manual check is actually available on the manual check payday. We will be reissuing our payroll calendars to let you know what those manual check paydays are, but in general, the manual check payday for the biweekly payroll will be the opposite Friday. So for example, we're all the biweekly employees are getting paid this Friday. Manual check payday will be next Friday. And in the case of the monthly payroll, it happens to be the 11th work day of the month following the payday. And what we have found is that generally falls smack dab right in the middle of um, that following month. So. 
any questions on that. The other thing that I wanted to remind you of is one of the opportunities that we have not been leveraging in the past that we now want to leverage to prevent overpayments in particular is if you find that the payroll has been confirmed and with that payroll confirming someone is going to be overpaid, notify Brandon in the case of the monthly payroll, Brandon Brooks, or Yolanda Terrain in the case of the biweekly payroll because we may actually have an opportunity, even if that individual is being paid through direct deposit, to strip off that direct deposit to make sure that that person is overpaid. And if you do that sort of as a reward for your good behavior, we will do the best that we can if it turns out that that person is still due a portion of that paycheck to get them a manual paycheck for the amount that they're actually due on the payday. Okay? Does that make sense? So even though the payroll is confirmed and it's direct deposit, we still have an opportunity to try to stop that payment from going through the bank. Any questions? Yes, question over there. Correct. The question was, is, does this, is this for paychecks that may have been lost, stolen, mutilated, spindled, or what have you? No, it's not. The manual check process is just for those individuals who did not receive a paycheck because their paperwork or their transaction did not hit the system in time to be processed in the regular payroll. Any other questions? Okay, again, I thank all of you for all of your hard work over the last year, and congratulations on making it um, 26 biweekly payrolls. And who do I turn it back over? Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay, so we um, are right at the time mark. Um, I just want to remind you, so first of all, thank you all for coming. Just want to remind you that uh, as uh, we show what's the mic, we did project this as a webinar, which means we recorded the session. And so um, you can find the session in just a few days. It'll be out on CC Info, along with all the past ones that we've done. So again, thanks so much for coming out. And uh, we'll see you not next month. Next month, we'll see you at the user conference, right? Um, so a couple months after that. So thanks, everybody.